The Arrhenius equation expresses a mathematical relationship between two variables, the rate of a chemical reaction and the temperature at which the reaction is occurring. Mathematically, we can write the Arrhenius equation as K, the rate constant, is equal to A, and we'll get to what these symbols mean in a second, E, the base of the natural logarithm, to the power of negative E sub A divided by RT. And it's important to understand what each of the symbols within this equation represents. K is a value we've seen before. This is the rate constant. This is what appears in the rate law as the constant of proportionality between concentrations and the differential rate. A is called the frequency factor. And we're going to revisit why it has this name frequency factor in a second after talking about the other components of this equation. E sub A is an energy value called the activation energy. This is the energy difference between the reactants and the transition state, the maximum of energy along the reaction path. R is the ideal gas constant, and since activation energies are usually expressed in joules or kilojoules per mole, R is typically the value here, 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole, although it's important to recognize that any form of R that works out to units of energy divided by temperature per mole would be totally fine to use as long as those units are compatible with the units of the activation energy. And finally, T is the temperature, and it's important to express the temperature here in Kelvin. Let's return briefly to this frequency factor, A. What exactly does this represent? Well, if you think about A, A is the rate constant when this entire second factor, this e to the negative e sub a divided by rt, ends up being equal to 1. And when is that the case? Well, this e raised to a power will be equal to 1 when the power itself is equal to 0. And so when t is equal to infinity, that is, when the temperature is infinite, we can say that the entire factor will be equal to 1 and the rate constant will be equal to A, the frequency factor. So you can think of A as the theoretically maximum rate constant insofar as it depends on temperature. At an infinite temperature, as hot as we can possibly make the system, the rate constant will be equal to the frequency factor. And at that temperature, basically waiting on molecules to collide is a non-issue, right? Because they're, in theory at least, moving at infinite speed. So really, the rate of the reaction in that case is limited only by the frequency of productive collisions. That's why this is called the frequency factor. There are two other forms of the Arrhenius equation that are worth keeping in mind that are useful for somewhat different purposes. If we take the natural log of both sides of the equation, we get a version that is useful in an experimental context, and we'll see that on the next slide. On the left, we get the natural log of k. On the right-hand side, we get two terms that are added now, since two terms are multiplied in the top equation there. We get the natural log of A plus the negative activation energy divided by R times the temperature, where this whole second term comes from applying the natural log to E to the negative E sub A divided by RT. You'll often see this written without the plus and minus, just as the natural log of A minus E sub A over RT. We get a second version of this equation. If we imagine two points in temperature rate constant space, you might say, one temperature with one rate constant and another temperature with another rate constant. Let's think about that and label the first situation state one and the second situation state two. So we have K1 and T1 and K2 and T2. If we take the two versions of the Arrhenius equation for those two situations and subtract them from one another, subtract equation 2 from equation 1, we end up with a two-state version of the Arrhenius equation. The difference between two logarithms is equal to the logarithm of their ratios. On the left, we get the natural log of k2 divided by k1. And then since we've subtracted the two equations, the natural logs go away and we just get negative e sub a over r, and then a difference in the 1 over t terms, 1 over t2 
minus 1 over t1. And it's important to be careful with the subscripts here. Notice that I left the negative sign out front. I like to do that since that negative sign shows up in the Arrhenius equation up here. That means that if I have k2 in the numerator and I leave the negative sign out front, then t2 should be the positive term in this difference. The 1 over t2 term should be positive, and the 1 over t1 term will be negative. This is just a consequence of the math, but it's worth pointing out because it's easy to get that sign confused. A way to verify that you're using the proper equation is to plug in some numbers and make sure that as the temperature increases, k increases. In other words, if k2 is greater than k1, then it should work out that t2 is greater than t1. If it doesn't, you've got the signs backwards. Let's look a little more closely at that second version of the Arrhenius equation that I labeled a on the previous slide. If we choose our variables properly, we can actually make this look like a linear equation. Namely, if we think of the natural log of k as the y variable and 1 over the temperature as the x variable, I'll go ahead and circle all this to show that we're calling this the x variable, then we can see that what we have here is a linear equation. We've got y is equal to some y-intercept, which ends up being the natural log of a, plus m, the slope of the line, which turns out to be negative e sub a divided by r, times x, which is 1 over the temperature. When you plot the natural log of k versus 1 over t, then, if your data fits the Arrhenius equation, you should expect the form of a line, and that's what we see in this graph over here. This plot of the natural log of k on the y-axis and 1 over the temperature in Kelvin on the x-axis is known as an Arrhenius plot, and hopefully the reasons for that are clear. The linearity of this plot is grounded in the Arrhenius equation. When 1 over t is equal to 0, that means we're at 0 on the x-axis of this graph, which corresponds to the y-intercept. This corresponds to x equals 0. But in that case, this entire mx term over here is going to come out to 0, and we're going to end up with y is equal to the natural log of a right here. So what we can see from this is that the y-intercept of this Arrhenius plot curve is related to the frequency factor. Specifically, the frequency factor is equal to e to the b power, where b is the y-intercept. We can also get some very useful information from the slope of this plot by recognizing that this entire slope term negative ea over r is what multiplies 1 over t, and that amounts to the slope of this line. So we can look at the rise over run between two points or using a line of regression or whatever method is most convenient to determine the activation energy of the reaction. Specifically, the activation energy is equal to the negative of the slope times r, the ideal gas constant. If you express r as 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, you'll end up with an active activation energy in joules per mole. These tend to be fairly large, and so we'll often divide by 1,000 and express them in kilojoules per mole. To summarize, the beauty of an Arrhenius plot is that we can collect data of the rate constant as a function of temperature, both of which are easily measurable from experiment by measuring the rate law and measuring the temperature. And from those very experimental, fairly easily measurable quantities, we can get to quantities which are much, much more difficult to measure, namely the frequency factor and the activation energy, which have a lot of theoretical value but can't be measured directly. Finally, I want to briefly return to the notion that the Arrhenius equation gives us insight into the relation between the rate constant and the temperature of the reaction. In other words, it tells us about the temperature dependence of the rate constant. Try plugging in a few values for the temperature here, ranging from, say, 290 Kelvin to 390 Kelvin, and see how the rate constant changes for some arbitrary value of A and the activation energy. You'll notice that as the temperature goes up, the rate constant goes up. And this is consistent with collision theory and some of the ideas about the molecular basis of chemical kinetics that we've developed already. Here's a graph that illustrates this dependence, showing how the reaction rate increases rapidly with temperature, and it starts to taper off as we get to higher temperatures. The other thing I want you to notice is the role of the activation energy. 
as the activation energy increases, the steepness of these K versus temperature curves goes down. They start to flatten out. Put another way, it takes more temperature to bring us up to the same level of rate constant at a higher activation energy. The activation energy causes a resistance of the reaction to temperature in chemical kinetics terms. The reaction is slower overall as a result of the higher activation energy.